All right, welcome everybody. I am so thrilled to have Debbie Busby on the call today. And this has been one that I've wanted to do for a long time. And I'm so grateful that um, she's made herself available for this. Debbie, would you be willing to share a little bit about your professional background so that the audience knows exactly who you are and what you do as context for our chat today? Yeah, I will. And thanks for inviting me to speak to you today, Sarah. It's just, it's so exciting to be um here and and um having this conversation with you so so yeah i'm um um i'm in the uk and i am um a clinical behaviorist a clinical animal behaviorist working with horses and dogs horses are my passion and have been all my life um so that's the that's the clinical sort of consulting side of what i do but i'm also um in more broad terms, an animal behaviour consultant. So I'm also asked to do lectures, to write, write articles, present webinars. Um, I am starting to do a lot more supervision now. So supervision of practitioners, which for me is a really important part of my work. Um, and um, expert witness is also some of some of the work that I do in that respect. And I will also supervise some master's dissertation students every year as well. Going back to um, what I just said about being a supervisor for um, practitioners, that's for behaviour practitioners. So that might be for um, candidate or kind of applicant members who are wanting to join the professional bodies that we have in the UK, or it might be practitioners who recognise the benefit of supervision and um, come to me for that. And the reason that I understand the benefit of supervision is because um, a, another piece of work that I do is as a transactional analysis psychotherapist. And so I have to have supervision for that. And um, it's it's almost like I think it's going to be like my life mission to try and get supervision for clinical behaviorists more um, more to the foreground of the picture, really, because as behaviorists, you know, we're not only dealing with the emotions of the human clients, but also our animal clients. So we're taking on so much content material that really does need to be um, processed a lot of the time in, in some sort of supervisory context. So, uh, oh, and, oh yeah, so that's that. And I'm doing a PhD in horse human relationships. So. Oh, that's exciting. <laughs> I, I, I so, I'm so envious of your PhD. It's on my bucket list of, to get <laughs> one done at some point. It's just not right now. So oh, you'll, you'll get there, I'm sure. Yeah, at some point. Yeah, probably. Yeah. I, I, you said something that I really love, Debbie, which is sort of dear to my heart being someone in the equine world who also happens to be a psychotherapist. And, mm -hmm. um, and so the thing that I hear you say is this need for supervision for the professionals mm -hmm. and have that be more normalized for animal professionals. And one of the things I I always say, and we just taught a new cohort of Equisoma students a week ago, was it's interesting to me how in psychotherapy, counseling, et cetera, the helping professions, so to speak, human helping professions, how there's this sometimes implicit, sometimes explicit expectation that the therapist, the helper, the counselor is getting not only supervision or, or consultation support, but also their own therapy, their own healing Yes. So that they're able to um, do what is called the safe and effective use of themselves in therapy so that their own stuff doesn't come in and influence negatively the process of therapy or what's happening for the human client. And I've often felt, and I love hearing you say this, part of my mission has also been how do we help normalize supervision slash consultation plus personal work? whatever that personal work happens to look like mm -hmm. for horse trainers, equine behavior consultants, equine body workers, you know, anyone who's working in a capacity with animals, riding instructors, right? Mm -hmm. Equ equestrian coaches, like how, how are they not also expected 
Why is that not an expectation in those industries? Because weirdly, interestingly, they're also at an intersection relationally with different organisms that are in relationship and, and their stuff comes up in those contexts and can influence the course of what unfolds mm -hmm. in those contexts. And so I, I just really love hearing you say that because I feel like that has a real, it's a real important thing and really needs a lot of normalizing. Yes. You know, often there's that shame that prevents people from getting that. And mm -hmm. it's like, actually, no, this is a real necessity. If we're going to have that social license to practice, part of that social license to practice is how am I looking after my own effectiveness or how am I being safe in my use of myself as the professional? Yes. Yeah. Right. And I yeah. think that's such an important point. I think that really isn't yeah. taught is yeah. an awareness, even having that awareness of how you are, how you yourself are experiencing your practice with yeah. your client. And that client is a dyad of the, the human and the horse yeah. in the case that we're talking about um, to to be aware of, of that, of what's going on internally for you, mm -hmm. as well as what's happening um, to, with, with the, um, the horse and the human that you're working with, for sure. Yeah. Um, oh, there was something else you just said then as well that, um, oh, the shame, when you talked about shame. Mm -hmm. So I think that's another really important part of the animal behavior work. And so often, um, I don't know, there just seems to be, there seems to be some kind of discourse about you're supposed to come out of your animal behavior consultancy training, whatever that was. Mm -hmm. And then that's it. You're supposed to have all the answers, whatever case you get, you just, you're supposed to know about it. And there is this. I, you know, I see a lot of people just really being reticent about asking for help or information with cases because it's like, well, you know, you, you're, you've got your qualification, you've got your professional membership, that's it, you're just supposed to know everything now. And that is not the case. And it's not the case in other professions. And certainly not in, you know, in psychotherapy. Um, not at all. And that's, um, you know, another reason why we have supervision so yeah it's really really important point I think yeah it, it is essential especially when I think about if you're working in any kind of intersection where there's a, a client dyad and if you're working with horses there's always a dyad whether the horse is the primary client or the human is the primary client and the horse is the object that is being trained you know what I mean like I think about what the power dynamics might be in that relationship yeah. and and I think okay so regardless it's still an intersection um, because let's say the horse is the primary client or the subject of the intervention, but it's being done on behalf of the owner or the rider or what have you. So it's yeah. it's sort of in some ways similar to a parent child family therapy scenario or, you know, a couples therapy scenario where we're trying to navigate what's going on. And it's not quite the same, but it's got some similarities. And when I think about this, I think about um I think about the ARC model. I don't know if you know the ARC model um, in family therapy. And so in the United States, um, uh, there's a few different people who've come up with something called the ARC model, which is attachment regulation and competency. And it, it is a, a framework for how to work with the um, child, the youth as the identified patient. So as you would know, as a psychotherapist, often a kid is symptomatic of what is going on in the family. Sure. But the parents or the caregivers will bring the child to therapy and say, fix my kid. Yeah. And then the focus of the therapy is on getting this child's behavior to be different. But in reality, as you know, it's more complex than that. And so the ARC model focuses on, okay, yes, you got a kiddo that's struggling and maybe has some trauma and maybe has some challenges with stress or anxiety. And, that, and that's manifesting in a behavior. What are we doing to support the caregivers? Right. Yes. And what are we doing to support the caregiving system first before we focus in on the identified patient as the kiddo? Mm -hmm. Right. Because then and so I think of myself, OK, and so that requires both 
A, the practitioner, the human who's providing the intervention to be looking after themselves and their own childhood stuff and their own what we might call counter-transference, my reactivity towards what's happening in the client, right? And then from there, being able to support the caregivers who are then going to support different conditions for that kiddo. And then mm-hmm. if that kiddo's behavior changes because the conditions are different, because the behavior is simply reflective of the caregiver dynamics or maybe the caregiver's trauma that hasn't been looked at, sure. then 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 great, then that problem's no longer an issue. And then the kiddo can continue to develop and grow and learn and, and do what it's wanting to do in terms of developmental milestones or goals. Um, but we're setting those conditions and that requires the professional to be looking at their stuff And then we're also looking at the caregivers and I go, gosh, this has direct relevance Mm -hmm. for anyone who's doing animal or equine behavior consultation, horse training, horseback riding instruction. It's like, hey, here's the professional. And then we've got the human owner, the human rider, what's going on with them. And then there's the horse and we identify the horse as the identified patient all the time. And the horse is the source of the problem. And the human professional who's the equine trainer or whatever isn't, some are, some, I'm not going to paint everyone with the same brush stroke, but it's not a requirement in these industries that they do their work, right? Or get consultation or seek yeah. supervision. And so we've got a bunch of people who may have their own challenges that are intervening or, or influencing how they intervene. We've got the human owner or rider who whose stuff isn't part of the equation and the focus is on the identified patient, the horse, right? And so I go, wow, like that arc model is so brilliant. Like let's adapt it. I'm working on an illustration adaptation of that currently for this, but I think it really speaks to that is like, gosh, yes, there's differences, but the the structure is similar. The dynamics are similar. And how are we approaching this? This is where I mean like social license to practice. How can we have this bigger conversation You know, it's not just about like we see equestrian events and someone was excessively abusive and that affects social license to practice because there's other ways, but it's more than just that to me anyway. So it's like, how are we setting up the whole frame for how we're approaching the work? Right. Yeah, yeah, Mm -hmm. exactly. And that's a a really good way of of looking at it is it it is the, the whole frame. And I think that one of the pieces within that frame that you just alluded to is Mm the owner or the caregiver that's who we and you know we call them we've moved away you know or have why have we moved away from calling somebody an owner when you think of the paradigm that the horse still has to live in but we will you know sometimes we call them guardians or caregivers but then so often a behaviorist model would be or a trainer model would be to kind of parachute in right this is the problem this is what you need to do there's your sort of bullet point list of what you need to do that's that's your horse fixed yeah and nothing has changed in that caregiver in in the person they don't they might not understand so much why they've been given that information to do certainly emotionally there's been no change in perspective and it's really interesting that you mentioned about family therapy or couples therapy because yeah. it was only for the first time um the other day in a, another group of people that I kind of dared to venture that in a way part of what I'm doing when I work with the horse and their caregiver is similar yeah. to couples therapy mm-hmm. um yeah it's um it's there are so many similarities and this is why I when I work with um horse client horses and their caregivers so Mm -hmm. as a client dyad yeah I won't I work with them usually on a long-term basis yeah similar to how you know my therapy clients psychotherapy clients come Mm -hmm. to me weekly I would probably see um equine clients say every three weeks or monthly but it's not um certainly in the UK when when I first learned behavior how how to be a behaviorist um the model was you go in you do your kind of um 
a, a very sort of medical level of, of a type of diagnosis. This is my diagnosis. This is my treatment plan. This is what you need to do. Right. Okay. That's that. I might, you know, you might have one follow up to see how they're doing. And then it moved to doing, you know, a few more follow ups, but certainly not working with somebody on a long term basis where you are not just working with what's going on for the horse emotionally that's that's causing them problems with coping with the life they're being expected yeah. to lead but also the emotional issues that are happening for the human client or the human owner yeah. Yeah. as well yeah. because they're always is i think because of um because of the traditional paradigm that we have um and also i think yeah because in i suppose in north america you do have the natural horsemanship element which we had for a while in in mm -hmm. the uk but before that we had you know it's even even more traditional um we would call it a sort of british horse society way of of training horses but still very negatively reinforcement um based uh negative reinforcement based the point about that is um and i think i mean i'm probably going off a bit of a tangent now but people just are still always talking about is it negative reinforcement is it positive reinforcement what we should be talking about is is it are we talking about appetitive stimuli or aversive stimuli what in terms of what the horse is experiencing is it experiencing something good positive in uh, in um, terms of valence or is it experiencing something bad or negative in terms of valence and it's so it's become so confusing mm -hmm. for lay people to have to deal with these four quadrants remember what they are remember that you know negative means taking away positive means adding that is such a mathematical scientific kind of laboratory definition that you couldn't expect anybody yeah. to hold in their heads when they've grown up with a different connotation of you know negative and positive so it's a, yeah so it, yeah a lot to unpick in a behavior consultation and you know it certainly isn't just this formula of well if you do xyz well, and, then, and it's, it's it's neat that you say that because I think there is this a we're in a society where we want quick fixes and uh -huh. there's not a lot of tolerance or attention span for nuance. Yeah. And yeah. and I I'm reminded of a, a a training not a training a presentation I went to with Gabor Mate who talks a lot about um, like he wrote the um, uh, when the body says no and um, scattered minds and a few other books that are really quite interesting uh, in the realm of hungry ghosts. Um, about addiction and so on. And I went yeah. to one of his talks and he spoke a little bit about um, people who self-select into their professions and they do so for a reason, right? Yeah. And and so I, I think to myself, and he talked a little bit about medical doctors, like what is the type of person who tends to be drawn to becoming a medical doctor? And, and he, it was an interesting conversation because I was thinking about that and it's like, oh, right. So, and this and this is where it gets so fascinating for me and so layered. So if you have a history of, um, let's say it starts off as being someone who wants to help others, right? Often when we're little kids, it starts from a more pure place, you know, yeah. and then maybe there's expectation. Maybe there's a family history of medical doctors in the family, and it's just expected that you become that. Uh, and then you have to live up to the family expectation. And so the, ex the and then it's about how do I, um, as a member in this family gain your approval and your love it's because I've met your expectations so I what drove me into becoming a medical doctor is maybe a little bit about interest but maybe largely about gaining approval and love in my family and then I learned to override my own needs and my own abilities in order to meet that and then grad school for medical doctors is quite difficult it is all about override 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 let's overwhelm you all and see who survival of the fittest kind of mm -hmm. idea and so then we further override these folks who are already good at overriding to start with to meet family expectations let's say um, and then they become medical doctors and then there's this real um performance pressure 
and that, around needing to know, having the right answer, being, and, you know, and then when we're, we're working in a model where it's very quick, I got five minutes to see you, you know, and so, so there's almost like, um, a setup, like who gets set up or drawn into certain careers. And maybe it started from a, a more, like I said, a more innocent place originally, but then it gets layered by family dynamics and attachment and various other things and patterns in the nervous system, patterns of learning to disregard my needs and my, my stuff in order to, you know, get by. And so I think about, you know, people who are drawn into becoming horse trainers, for instance. Again, this is not true across the board. This isn't true for all doctors. So please don't paint this with the same broad, mm. broad, broad brush stroke, right? Yeah, yeah. But more like the idea that there are interesting things that lead us to be drawn to certain things. And so when I think about who is drawn into becoming, say, a horse trainer, you know, then there's going to be a whole bunch of layers there. There's going to be potentially family history, a love of animals, but maybe there's, especially if you're a horse trainer that does use a more positive punishment, you know, negative reinforcement in the aversive quality of negative reinforcement, because not all pressure release is experienced as aversive. And so it's one of those weird things where yeah, it's so not, escalating you, pressure. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like you can have some pressure and it's not at all experienced as a negative. You know what I mean? So there's ne there's nuance there too. Yes. There but if some, right. Yeah. And so yeah. it's complicated. And so I go, okay, what like so there's going to be history and maybe family lineage and maybe um, sometimes I don't, I'm not saying this is true for all people. Sometimes we're drawn into a profession because in horse training, it has often been about dominance and, you know, and so if, and there is something reinforcing for the human to swoop in, look at me, I've got all the answers and I get to fix the problem and leave. And I get to feel good about myself. And if that is being driven by early stuff around inadequacy or needing to gain approval by performing and having the answers. And, and there's something about that. I mean, guru culture is established by these early experiences, yeah. right? And mm -hmm. so, so I'm not saying that's true of all horse trainers. I'm not saying that's true of all medical doctors, right? These are just two yeah. small examples, but mm -hmm. there's a lot of nuance there. And so I go, Hmm, like, like someone who becomes a couples therapist you you do need to put in that work and put in that time and recognize that you're sitting with a lot of unknowns and mm -hmm. the uncertainties and we can't be gurus we can't be know-it-all folks mm -hmm. right and and so in essence a horse trainer often is acting in a similar capacity to a, a, a couples therapist mm -hmm. an equine behavior specialist may be acting in a similar context as a couples therapist yeah. and yet the frame is so different and why is that and i go ah so how much of that is ancestral historical you know horses being viewed yes. as chattel right horses being exactly. viewed as ownership or property so there's all these these layers and then there's again, the self-selecting, mm. I feel good about having the answers. It's harder for me to not have the answers and sit yes. in the shades of gray and not know, yeah. because then what might happen if I were to say, I don't know, mm. right? Quick fix is really safe and comfortable, but it might not be the full picture. And often, as you know, it isn't the full picture. Yes. And yeah. we're in that, we're in this microwave society where we hit the button and two minutes later, we've got our heated meal, you know? Mm. And so, there is all these things that kind of feed into what I think has become um, an industry sort of difficulty. You know, when we talk about the social license to practice and we see this in the equestrian sport, equestrian sport requires benchmarks and to get places and to have certain norms and standards, but who created those norms and standards? Why is it built on that? Yes. What led to that? You know, and so it's all very interesting when you yeah. start to pull it apart and so how do we start to have these conversations and say hey like the tides are changing they if we all want to be effective in our work we have to look at ourselves and and it's like the slow food movement it can't be microwave meals it's it's gonna be you know yeah you know. and I think um you know so much of what you said there relates to identity and I think yeah. that's one of the um sort of tension points at the moment because you know, what if somebody was drawn to working right. with horses because there was a, a sort of, you know, being able to dominate a large, powerful creature? What yeah. if that met a need of theirs that had yes. come 
that had kind of grown up with them from their life script and yeah. now we're starting to talk about more ethical practices and the, you know the the concept of a good life as it relates to horses and seeing them as even sentient creatures and then oh hey right they have emotions so we've got to deal with that oh okay so they experience things as good or bad so now we have to recognize that sometimes in order for me as in you know another a rider to achieve their goals maybe their horse ends up not having such a great life in order for the rider to achieve their goals but that's all about that person's identity so no wonder you know people think we're not getting very far in terms of welfare sometimes because um because it is so wrapped up in identity and also i'm thinking now about the fei and their um ethics and well-being commission or mm. well-being and ethics commission but the, the you know the ferrari about the fei and, and, and what the fei aren't doing is that's all wrapped up when you start talking about sports horses it's wrapped up in so much money and so much yeah. economic power yeah that um that that just adds another layer to it and i think you know what you were saying also about um well we were both saying about kind of you know helicoptering in and being the rescuer which yes. which for me yeah. uh, in terms of transactional analysis always takes me to the drama triangle yeah um this can you concept, can you can you describe the the, the dry, yeah can you describe yeah, that triangle so, so the people know? Yeah. yeah it's mm -hmm. so in, in transactional analysis this is this idea of games that we play games with each other that have ulterior motives mm -hmm. in order to satisfy a, a need in some way or in order for us to feel that we are on the right path for our life script right I say right in terms of what we have learned it probably isn't probably in healthy mental terms it isn't right for us but we feel that it's right so the drama triangle has three points and one of those points is um the rescuer and the other another point is the persecutor and the other point is the victim so I when I look at you know myself and my behaviorist colleagues I think wow you know we just found ourselves in this profession because we are all very very strongly rescuers yeah. Yeah. but it, um, and the thing about the drama triangle is it is one of these kind of interpsychic or um, commute games of communication that we play with each other so it's not healthy yeah. um, and so, but then, you know, if we are, as behaviorists, if we are the rescuer, yeah. who is the persecutor and who is the victim? Is, the, is, it the, is it the horse that's the victim? So, well, then you have to have somebody in the role of persecutor. Who yeah. is it? Is it yeah. the owner? Is it the FEI? Is it somebody else, the, you know, the veterinarian sometimes? Um, and then we can move ourselves or people move around that drama triangle so for example as a behaviorist i might start off feeling very rescuey yes i want to help you you've mm. got this problem with your horse i want to help your horse i want to help you yeah but then through work if i'm working and this this is another argument for vision because mm -hmm. I need to be able to recognize this in myself. If I start to feel frustration towards the client or, or anger, hmm. I need to know that that's what's happening. And I need to know who I'm feeling angry or frustrated towards, because that moves me along the drama triangle one spot to the persecutor. So then if I've become the persecutor, who then has become the victim and, and then who becomes the rescuer? Yeah. So I think that's it's it's a, you know, a sort of crucial part of, of the work that we do and certainly um, requires that we're aware of that. We are aware of the processes that are going on within ourselves as at the same time that we're trying to help and support um, the the people or the horses that that we're aiming to help 
Well, and I love that you've named this because this speaks to these nuances of how are we as professionals working in the horse world, owning our stuff? How are we working yeah. on our stuff so that our, what we're calling this, the counter transference, right? So that the, our response to the client, our inner reaction to the client isn't coming in and influencing what we're doing, our training methods, our interventions, whatever you want to call them, depending on your scope of practice, yes. because it's like that starts to really shift things because you're going to have some people who may believe they're coming in as a rescuer but their methods are persecutory sure right and then you're going to have people who are coming in who because of their own trauma have a distorted perception of what's happening because everything i've had this bad thing happen and now i'm sensitized to those bad things happening and now whenever i see even the slightest tiniest thing my my nervous system's capacity to sort properly about what's happening in the world is a little distorted because of my own history and so i might look at a situation and misread it as being abusive problematic etc come in and swoop in as the rescuer and going you're being abusive because we're seeing a lot of this drama triangle playing out right now especially in north america between the natural horsemanship and the clicker trainer camps okay and so there's a lot of the well you're doing it wrong well you're doing it wrong and you're i'm coming in as the rescuer and you're being harmful so i'm the rescuer you're the persecutor and the victim would be the horse mm -hmm. and i look at that and both camps are doing it right both yes. camps are pointing the finger at the other and going you're the rat you're the bad guy you're the wrong one mm -hmm. and and so i look at that and i go that's so fascinating so there's the drama triangle playing out and yeah. all of that is mapped on to nervous system patterning and attachment patterning in yeah. family of origin stuff and so if i in my history have experienced um, a lot of abuse or I experienced other people being harmful or violent or what have you and I can't recognize a distinction that's what I was saying earlier between say negative reinforcement escalating pressure where the aversive it's pressure is not experienced as an aversive because it's yeah. nuanced yes. but I see that and I lump all of that into the same camp and all negative reinforcement is therefore bad. And I come from that perspective that usually for me as a psychotherapist, I go, oh, so what has, what happened in your history where the, the sort now is this equals this always. And there's a black and white perception. So I get to be the wonderful rescuer and I'm gonna point the finger at you as a persecutor. And because no one came in and rescued me when the bad thing actually did happen. So I now get to be that person. Yeah. And it happens in the other direction as well. And so it's interesting for me on that level, because then I also think, oh, because then, the, as you said, the, the, the rescuer can very quickly become the persecutor. Mm -hmm. So so I've seen that as well, where there's going to be folks in either camp who will point the finger and say, you're the persecutor. But then in online forums on social media, yes. they themselves become the persecutors. Yeah. And think that they're being rescuers, but they're actually acting in a very persecutory way. And so you see, and the horse in all this is usually the identified victim, which is interesting because equines also have agency to a certain degree, some more than others, depending on their contexts and their domesticated horses have often have varying degrees of agency. Some yeah. have far less than others, but there's also the equine in that. And is there, is there also a disservice in pegging the equine as victim in this drama triangle. You know, it's it's not giving the animal more credit um, as well for what it's due. I think there's a book that's just come out recently looking at acts of animal resistance. Oh, um, yes. Yeah, I'm very juicy about that. That's exciting. Yeah. I'm like really excited about that because that's, that's almost, yeah. right? It's like the, the, the very, this is where it's almost like the agency of, no, I'm choosing not to engage with you out of my own self-determination. Yes. And it reminds me a bit of Peter Levine when he talks about healthy aggression, like the no, the healthy no. Yeah. And, and how much do we allow the healthy no? And how many, how many people didn't get to have a healthy no? And, and all of this starts to become very, again, very fascinating and very nuanced. And so I love that you brought up the drama triangle because I see it playing out all the time. Um, and, this, and the sad thing about this, and I, I want to speak back around to what you said about the quadrants and behaviorism. Mm -hmm. So for those of you who are listening in who don't know what the quadrants are, so as, as Debbie was saying, so in, in behaviorism, there's the four quadrants of operant conditioning. So operant conditioning includes uh, positive and negative reinforcement, which are the most two commonly known ones. Positive reinforcement would be that we offer something desire, desirable in response to the behavior that we're wanting to see. So you do something great, you get a treat, or you get a star on your chart, or you get, you know, 
applause. You know, that's all examples of positive reinforcement. Negative reinforcement is you remove something uncomfortable in response to the correct behavior. So one is offering something desirable, one is removing something that's uncomfortable. And there's varying degrees of how that's defined. And so that would be sort of the, tar the two main ways that we do it. Um, the, then there's positive and negative punishment. So positive punishment would be what we would often think about as often turning into abuse, where somebody does something and we add something undesirable in response to the behavior we don't want. Um, and then negative punishment would be, I remove something desirable in relation to the thing I don't want. That one's often used in parenting. Well, you don't eat your vegetables. You're not going to get to watch your TV show after, after dinner, yeah. right? So commonly, <laughs> commonly used, right? What's that? Time out. Is another time out. Yeah. Versus <laughs> time in where I'm hanging out with you because you can't regulate for yourself. So we're going to hang out together and work yeah. through this. And then when you're calmer, we'll have a conversation. So time out would be, yeah, I'm going to remove love and attention from you in response to this behavior. You can see why timeouts at sometimes can be problematic. Exactly. So, but yeah. In a way yeah. where the effect is negative punishment, because that's another yes. important part that's often missed is yeah. it's the when we're talking about any of these quadrants, people talk about them as if they're using them like a tool, like, you know, yeah. This pen yeah. is negative punishment, but in fact, what we're talking about is the behavioral effects. Yeah. Behavioral effect was that that behavior was positively reinforced or that behavior yes. was negatively punished. And that's something that's missed. And that's another, something else that I think a lot about is that, um, you know, behaviorism started in the laboratory everything's yeah. controlled all the yeah. variables are controlled even yeah. like I said before the language is very yeah. mathematical yes so it's clear and everybody is clear that this phrase means this thing and it doesn't mean another thing and that's how we work but then behaviorism for all it that it's brilliant it came out into the world and became an applied concept. And then it was like the Pandora's box opened and people are just using, throwing these terms around in ways that yeah. they don't fully understand. They're teaching these terms incorrectly to yes. people who are just learning about um, this stuff. Yeah. And so, and then it all gets a bit, messy in the real world and then yeah. and that's just another vehicle through which people can you know persecute each other and another right. reason, the, the mutual persecution and as you said the horse the the horse where is the horse everybody you know both camps are being persecutory towards each other it's almost yeah. as if the horse disappears into the background totally. going oh remember me I'm the one that you're supposed to be thinking about but yeah yeah, yeah. And all these humans are having all this activation and it's just like, hey, yes. hang on a second. Can we look at ourselves here? Mm -hmm. You know, just before you made that accusation, what was happening in your body? Can we start to help and back this up a little bit and get curious about what is driving our behavior? And maybe it's a nervous system response tied to my own trauma and that I need to do some healing work on myself. And, and, and so that I can start to see more of the nuances and what's happening instead of spreading, you know, painting everything with a brush stroke. Right. And so it's kind of like, um, the other piece to this that I think is unfortunate is let's layer onto this, uh, ableism and, um, privilege, economic privilege and so on, because here's the thing, learning about the four quadrants of behaviorism and then all the nuances within that and then all the layers around terminology and then what is differential reinforcement and then what is counter conditioning and and then it's like you get into all these techniquey things which like yes. you said derived in lab settings don't always translate as well to real world because the real world has all these other layers around just these quadrants and so we get these these quadrants and then already the four quadrants are complicated to make sense of even like you said the terminology is problematic i i remember once saying why can't we call it additive and subtractive reinforcement what are we adding what are we subtracting it just seems a little bit less balanced around good versus bad right yes. 
you know, the, the, the average lay person. So when the average lay person says, oh, well, I don't do negative reinforcement because that means I'm doing bad things. I don't want to yeah. think of myself as a horse abuser, but in reality, they are actually using pressure release methods. Again, there's nothing inherently wrong with that. Depends on a lot of variables, right? So it's how it's experienced, right? There's so much nuance there. So I go, okay, but the the point of reference for the word is the general audience layperson point of reference for negative versus positive. So, so that adds into the confusion and so then the negative reinforcement folks go, well, I'm not doing that. I've seen this happen where somebody says, well, I don't do negative reinforcement. I work with energy. And then they proceed to pressure release using body energy. Yeah. And and, it, and yeah, sure. It might not have been experienced as an aversive. Moving off the slightest pressure is maybe not aversive. It's maybe very neutral, you know, like it doesn't always have to be aversive, but it's, but technically that was negative reinforcement, <laughs> you know, but they're not calling it that because there's this perception that, oh, that's bad you know yes. and so yeah. so all this nuance and i go okay but let's say you're someone who has you came from a poor background where you weren't able to complete school and maybe you have a you, you had trauma and it made it difficult to pay attention in school mm -hmm. or maybe you have a learning difficulty and you weren't able to make sense of stuff or you know all, and so there's all this other layer of the information required to get this is so in some ways complicated that the average person who may be drawn to say becoming a horse trainer or a horseback riding instructor, et cetera, may doesn't want to have the time to go do a PhD in learning. Exactly. You know what I mean? And so there's that problem too, is that the concepts yes. that these that, that are being used in these industries are so complex yeah. and require so much knowledge to understand to use them properly that 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 knowledge base isn't always accessible. Yes. And then, so then that creates a problem as well. And so then we've got people throwing slings and arrows at each other, not just because of their own trauma responses and their own polarization and you versus you. Um, and maybe I'm misinterpreting stuff because of my own reactivity and my own lens, which mm -hmm. is colored by my experiences. But then there's also the layers of privilege and layers of ableism and what was I able to learn and what can I learn and what do I even have the capacity to learn and is that someone's fault and then how do we handle that layer of this yeah. and it's just so nuanced. Mm. It really know? is and yeah, yeah. You, you just you made me realize then because my undergrad was psychology yeah. and actually so much of what's spoken about in training and behavior is at that level it's at degree level yeah. undergraduate psychology and why does it need to be that complex why do we need to talk in those terms why can't we yeah. simplify them yeah I mean yeah uh and, and you know what you, what you mentioned then about could we could we rename negative and positive reinforcement um some people do term negative reinforcement as removal reinforcement so they okay. have, have yeah. renamed it removal reinforcement yeah. because you're removing something right um but even i don't know you know i just think well if i'm if i'm explaining to somebody who has no who's never experienced anything to do with training or psychology yeah. or behavior if i'm if i'm if i'm talking about reinforcing so i always think well people are talking about reinforcing they always think that something is in a way being added because you're talking about strengthening, aren't you? And then, so how can you strengthen something without yeah. adding something in? It's to do with building. I always think that, you know, a, a completely lay person might have that kind of perception of what we're right. talking about. So, you know, then what do we call, do we call it, you know, how do we re reframe reinforcement or how do we reframe any of it? And why do so and we're doing it now why are people fixated on the operant side of learning that's it and, um don't get they don't seem to get any further than that and they don't yeah. see the rich joy that there is in classical conditioning and classical counter conditioning um which is what i use most of in in my um behavior work so and there's even more beyond that, because I think about all the ethological in underpinnings and all the yes. attachment based stuff and all the yeah. somatic based stuff. And that's more where I land. And I kind of go, but there's so much beyond behaviorism in this, this sort of strict defini defined way yes. of, yes. you know, the operant quadrants. And and so there's going to be like. And I always say this, like, it's really, really helpful if you're doing any kind of equine stuff 
get to know the quadrants, get to learn about those four. They're very important to know uh, because learning how to use those effectively is, is really good. It's really good stuff. Um, and to know that there's more out there, but they're even beyond that, around that there's even more. And, and as you would know, like we're not just looking at human behavior change if I think of the arc model again right mm -hmm. so there's you know working with the caregiver and then we work with the identified patient right and so if the identified patient is the horse yeah. what are we doing to help the owners the riders etc and then us again as the professionals but then there's also going to be the conditions the broader conditions right and so is there pain is there medical stuff is is the environmental conditions this is where the ethology comes in yes you know yeah. are the conditions contributing to the nervous system feeling safe or not safe mm -hmm. you know are the conditions allowing the animal to meet their biological and natural needs for so sociality and exploration yeah. and movement and are those needs being met and are that that's also part of this equation. So it's not as simple as, well, let's just change the human behavior. No, we also need to work at these humans and these horses are in an environment. Mm -hmm. I think of social work and human social work, person and environment, the pie yes. model, right? Yeah. And so it's kind of like that. So, you know, this arc model sits within the pie model. So to me, they're not separate, you know? So when people say, oh, human behavior chains, and I've seen this recently on social media where people are like, well, those of you who are talking about human behavior, you need to rule out pain and you need to rule out all these other things. Yes, but they're not mutually exclusive. Like when we, like yeah. to me, it's all part of the same thing, right? Like what are all the variables that we need to be looking at here, you know? And yeah. you had said something before our call, Debbie, about applied ethology. Um, yes. Would you say something a little bit about that? Because I thought it was so helpful because I think when we think about equine behavior consultants, I'll create a broad term here. Um, and sometimes mm -hmm. it's clinical animal behavior consultants, whatever. There's lots of designation acronyms that have been created. Um, and so we were talking before our call about how, yeah, it can be very helpful to hire someone who's a animal behavior and equine behavior consultant, whichever body they tend to be with. There's many and, and I go, but they're the framework around each of them may be different as well. So we were talking about how some are the word animal behavior consultant is a bit of a misnomer because some are very much strictly within operant conditioning mm -hmm. and some, some, some of the classical conditioning, counter conditioning, all the other behavioral methods that sort of fall in that universe beyond the four quadrants. Yeah. Some yeah. are very strictly with that. Some have that plus ethology attachment, you know, trauma informed perspective, et cetera. And so it's not just strictly behaviorist in the classical purist way. And I get there's nuances within that as well. So there's a lot of complexity and it's like, you almost need a degree just to figure out who the professionals are because it's like, what are they doing? So could you speak a bit more to the differences that in, and where you operate from? Because I found it really helpful because it means that the word behaviorist in the person's title isn't always defined the same way oh it so isn't and in yeah my experience it's almost there are cultural differences so right and you know I could be wrong about this but from what I've seen of how it's used in um North America and Canada it almost seems to be to have some sort of element of applied behavior analysis mm -hmm. which is I guess you would call that the sort of purest of mm -hmm. the behaviorist yeah. um, kind of could, on that side of the continuum, if you were going to look at it like that. And then in the UK, I think we're kind of in the middle. I'll say a bit more about that in, in a bit. And so, you know, we call ourselves um, clinical behaviorists because uh, in some way, although this has never been kind of fully resolved, I don't think, but we, we work with a diagnostic model. So diagnosis, differential diagnosis, diagnosis, treatment plan. Yeah. Um, and then, in, so we're, we're called clinical behaviorists. Um, and then, but uh, yeah, and we have to meet very, we have to meet strict <laughs> educational, academic and professional registration requirements for that. In Europe, somebody that does the same kind of job that I do would be called an ethologist. And when I did my, I mean, I started my equine behavior training in 2004, so that's nearly 20. Um, and 
really the uh, the learning theory element of the operant conditioning the classical conditioning that is that was the tiny tip of a, a triangle if you you know an iceberg and underneath that were so many layers of yeah. um the ethology of the, well evolution and, and domestication even that is a you know a tricky um tricky to unpick for horses because they weren't domesticated in the same way that say dogs or cats were right so that um, and I always call it the thin veneer of domestication it's you know what does domestication mean when it comes to horses and uh, and I think that very often has given us historically permission to treat them and manage them in in certain ways certainly it's in the need to know about evolution when you know about evolution and then you compare it to how we traditionally keep and manage horses you can just completely see what a fish out of water they are so that's the first thing you need to know about yeah. then the actual ethology so the kind of even um there's a, a term in ethics called called telos 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 don't know how to pronounce <laughs> it I, I call it telos which is almost like an, uh, was it aristotle not sure um i <laughs> need to go back to my notes for this but it's that's kind of defining the hoarseness of the horse it's even you know beyond its ecological niche what is this being and what does it need in order to fulfill that its own innate uniqueness quality essence yeah. so there's a need to know about that what is the natural ethogram what is it that horses do naturally when they're free roaming um attachment theory so important because of the way again this kind of um mismatch between how horses would naturally be born and weaned as foals and then how they would you know either live with their extended family or move away from their birth herd how that works how and how even how mating takes place and then compare that to how we do it in what I would call a captive managed context yes. yeah. how how different that is and how you know if you talk about trauma and you think about how a, a typical like you know if you think about how a typical hot sports horse is started weaned at between four and six months which is too young maybe moved maybe even moves countries at that point moves away this, when you when you learn about the ethology of horses you know that they have this home range this very strong mental mind map of what is their home range well you know in, in all sorts of horse owning contexts we just buy and sell horses in the same way as we would do a used car and even if we own the same horse we will move it from barn or livery yard in the UK move them from premises to premises facility to facility without a second thought yeah. every time we do it they're having to reorganize their relationships <laughs> with the horses that they find themselves in the same field with that they have no social relationship whatsoever so so all that when you and when you think of how long it would take to learn about that on one kind of equine behavior course you realize that the learning theory is a small part of it for sure it's an important part of it but it comes mm -hmm. after Mm -hmm. required understanding of what is it that actually makes a horse a horse because if you don't know that you don't you won't understand the effect of the techniques for want of a better word that, that yeah. you're using to try to change that horse's behavior and we haven't even you know in that in all that I didn't even speak about the context concept of agency well which is yeah. so relevant yeah and it, it's so it's so interesting because I I think this is one of the arguments that I hear is 
um, in, in our training program, we look a lot at ethology. And I think my introduction to ethology wasn't through horses first. It was through my training in somatic experiencing, which is all yeah. about how animals in the wild recover from what you might consider to be a traumatic event without showing signs of PTSD. And a lot of that, it reflects in terms of a few things. One is, well, the conditions are different. Right. Yeah. If they start in safety with their herds, so they've got a baseline of regulation, safety connection, you know, uninterrupted, largely speaking, generally speaking, of families and bands and so on. And then when they have stressors, they're short lived. Yes. A predator comes and then you fight or flee and you either do that successfully or you die trying. Exactly. And then, right. And it's short term. And then you go into freeze, maybe you shut down because you weren't able to, but maybe the predator goes away and then you deactivate and discharge all of that. Mm. And then you go resume peaceful existence with your herd and your connections and your safety and your affiliation behaviors. And you're, yeah. you've got this, what goes up, comes down kind of feature. And there's an expansiveness of my range. I, I'm with my, you know, there's a continuity of connection. Mm -hmm. And so the conditions are very different than in captivity. Yes. Yeah. And, and the affiliation, the affiliation piece is so relevant and it's the yeah. piece that's so missing. That's it. Yeah. And we don't have that for a lot of domesticated horses. Like you said, the weaning is too early. They're kept in boxes. You know, they're all these different things. And so, and then training methods are largely conflictual based if we're misusing negative reinforcement or we're excessively focused more on punishment um then yeah like it, it can create ripple effects disrupted connections and so on human interference human trauma dysregulation that adds to how they intervene and the methods they use and so and any kind of training things i know there was at least one study that looked at um, human attachment styles and the types of training methods that they were drawn to yes. or used. And I go, wow, that's so interesting. Like if you were more of an authoritarian um, trainer, top down, dominance based, punishment, heavy handed, were, were you treated like that in your family of origin? Like, you know, where does this get passed down, you know? Um, and so I expect blind obedience because that's what was expected of me. And so now I get to be the one to pass that on, you know, and so, yeah. you know, so there's all this trauma begets trauma stuff in captivity conditions where maybe we don't have, we don't start in safety and mobilize, deactivate and end in safety. We don't have that. And so one of the things I've often wondered was, well, when I think of the more strictly classic behaviorist perspective, and I think of that humane hierarchy where there's an order to which we do the quadrants, you know, and you start with positive reinforcement and then maybe negative reinforcement is like a last resort and then positive punishment is definitely a last resort. And I go, but that fails mm -hmm. to understand that equines in the wild can have negative reinforcement and then they deactivate and they go back to safety and it's not such a big deal because the conditions allow it to be experienced very differently. And that's where the nuances come in. And I go, well, gosh, if animals in the wild are able to use negative re reinforcement with each other, why is that less a, of an ethical issue than it is in captivity? Well, it's because the conditions are different, right? They have all the safety of connection and affiliative behavior as the baseline their physiology is one that reflects sustainable physiology because they're in that affiliative state. They have rest and digest. They've got all these beautiful things and the stressors are short-lived. They mobilize mm -hmm. and they end and they deactivate and move on with their day. Our captive animals don't have that a lot of the time, you know? And so it makes sense to me why there's this real purist behaviorist perspective at least I see and sometimes like you said in North America where ABA is really common mm -hmm. um where it's like oh well you know positive reinforcement first then differential then negative um and then you know the punishments right mm -hmm. and so I, I and I go well that makes sense to me if you're coming from the perspective that the environment isn't safe and the relationships are not safe and all stress is viewed as bad and all all pressure is viewed as aversive that tells me something about your frame, you know, and maybe what you've experienced inside. So then if all ethologically, it's like, well, how are we supporting more ethologically based conditions where we start in safety end in safety, where there's attachment security, where there's more of these natural environments. So like you said, the horse as horse gets to have what it needs to thrive. Mm -hmm. And then from there, maybe negative reinforcements experienced differently and maybe positive reinforcements experienced differently. And it's not so mechanical, you know, because all these other things are different, Yes. you know, right. And that's where I go, wow, why are, where are these conversations happening? You know, because that's where I go, Hey, there's so much beyond these quadrants yeah. that actually affects how the quadrants are experienced.
yeah you yes know? yeah right yeah um, yeah and um, I think that's such a good point about you know not only about well how is negative reinforcement being experienced but how is positive reinforcement yeah. experienced you know positive yeah. reinforcement there's you know there's a there are sort of groups that just see that as you know the holy grail and that's all we need to do just feed yeah. minimal treats yes and, uh, certainly with horses with dogs as well because i i work behaviorally with dogs too mm -hmm. um, there is just so much opportunity for confusion and frustration there and yeah. you know the if you look at the kind of crossways of the quadrants the other side of positive reinforcement is is withholding withholding yeah. something negative punishment valuable to the horse yeah and you know people are working with you know not, not everybody does this by any means but people you know work with treats or food rewards that are you know too high value sometimes yeah um but um oh something else you said there about something that I might have to come back to when I've remembered it but going back to this idea about um the uh, I think I was talking about um thinking well it's almost like we were done a disservice in the UK somebody decided yeah. at some point we were going to be called clinical behaviorists and right oh yes that, yes mm -hmm. yeah and that has all it's almost kind of done us a disservice because you know behaviorist is the behave if you look at behaviorism in terms of you know Skinner Thorndike Watson that's such a tiny percentage of what we do compared right. to what you were just talking about of, of setting up the, yeah. the whole environment which yes. enables the animal to thrive and yes. once that is possible then the experiences of being trained being ridden become mm -hmm. different but yes. can, can have a different quality that's right so i you know i and somebody said to me once well you know you're you're not a behaviorist you're an applied ethologist right i think yeah i yeah I can't can't argue with that I think that might might have been a, be a better idea and I remember when I went to my so I'd done my um behaviorist training and right. then, then I had to, because I wanted to get my professional registration I had to kind of go back to undergraduate level to do my psychology degree okay which by the way was just all of my psychology degree was um was a kind of almost a repeat of what i'd learned on my equine right. behavior course except for a lot of the cognitive human sure. cognitive side um so i went to my first psychology conference stood up to ask a question proudly declared myself as a behaviorist and i could just feel this yeah. muttering frisson around the room because you know yeah. in so many psychology um groups behaviorism is literally still that you know they still see it as the black box nothing yeah. on nothing on the inside you know input and output and, yeah. and nothing going on inside and you know no application of, of neuroscience or yeah. anything like that so I, I'm, I'm so it's so interesting that you share that because that is definitely at least here in North America a lot of the again there's nuances within behaviorism as we're talking about but like the perception of it is you know pigeons pressing levers to get pellets you know and and so and so there is this sort of misperception and and I know when I did my undergrad in psychology many years ago as well, you, you know, you learn about behaviorism, but then you learn about the cognitive applications of behaviorism, and then you learn about attachment theory, and then you learn about all these other methods and waves within psychology. Mm -hmm. And and I go, wow, like in human psychology, we've largely evolved beyond behaviorism a long time ago. Right. Right. And so I go, oh, and so now there's this new wave of increased application of behaviorism within equines and animals, <clears throat> almost like it's there's a catching up that needs to happen within the animal industry where it's like, hey, yeah, we do need to know these quadrants a little bit better because we're not really using them very effectively. You know, so it's almost like we're the equine or animal world is catching up to where we got to in human psychology mm -hmm. it's like animal psychology it's like okay yeah behaviors and that's great so now it's like we're catching up and we're seeing all these purist behaviorists that are like 
we're not looking at the rest. We're just looking at these quadrants and, and the strict application of that. And then within that, we're getting this polarization of, neg of natural horsemanship versus purely positive clicker trainers, and neither will talk to each other. And that's an interesting subset phenomenon within this movement towards a greater understanding of how to apply the quadrants effectively. And then I go, right, and we still have catching up to do on top of that because we're, we're already well beyond that, you know, on the human end, but not entirely because as you know, ABA still is the primary way that our, that autistic people are treated. And this perception that autistic people have to learn certain behaviors and where's the ethological perspective on, on autism? How are we supporting the conditions? So for autistic wellness, as opposed to all this distress in environments that don't work for an autistic person. And then we quicker train you, you know, or we use the different quadrants to try to get you to learn certain behaviors. But in reality, the conditions are not quite right. And so how are we ethologically looking at autism? And so, so they're even within the human family, there are some groups that haven't evolved beyond behaviorism or are starting to. And so it's an interesting and sad parallel, I suppose. But at the same time, it's like, hey, let's keep having these conversations. You know, there is more to it, you know. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, you, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Oh, no, it's, I was just thinking it's so interesting um, what we're, you know, both talking about in terms of these polarized camps. Yeah. Uh, thinking back again to the transactional analysis drama triangle of right they are there's it, there's another and we usually shorten transactional analysis to ta ta yeah another mm -hmm. um concept in ta which is this idea that within us we have a kind of you know an inner parent an inner adult executive mm -hmm. function reasonable decision making and an inner child and the what doesn't happen on the drama triangle is nobody is functioning from their inner adult. So yeah. nobody is functioning from their sort of rational here and now executive functioning state. And that's, you know, it all, I'm always taken back to these polarized camps and thinking, well, that is, that's a reflection yeah. of how they're operating in, in um, reference to each other is not, you know, nobody is, where is the adult in that? Where is the adult ego state in mm. those quite conflictual, antagonistic conversations? Yeah, there's um, there's like all this overlay because the ego states and the per or the personality parts or whatever language you want to use, because there's, as you know, there's so many parts work models of which TA is one of a number. Um, and some are more complicated where there's multiple kinds of parts and they're categorized slightly differently. Self would be the adult. You know, there's lots of yes. different ways of looking at it. Yes. But if we think parts work models in general, this idea of like <clears throat> there's the parts um, and the witness or the self or the adult, inner adult, whatever you want to call it. And then where is that? And that's missing. And then there's the traumas that led to that in the first place being the case, you know, and then how did we adapt by having the reactions that we do in these certain concepts? And then what, what's behind that reaction just before, like I said earlier, just before you launched into, you know, becoming the savior, the rescuer, what was the sensation in your body? What was the emotion that was starting to show up? And can we sit there and track with that and work through working through the resolution of the thing that the driving the triangle or the coming at this from, you know, the punitive parent or the needy child that was not protected, you know? Um, and so whatever framework you want to use, I mean, ultimately it's all sort of pointing at this idea that something is driving the polarity and we retreat to our polarities in part also because a it feels safer um <clears throat> it's a sometimes a way where we get our attachment needs met yeah. yeah i didn't feel like i was safe and so i'm going to find a whole bunch of other people who have the same trauma as me and the same perception as me yes. and and we're going to find some connection with each other and we're going to put slings and arrows at each other because now i've got backup now i've got yeah, other people got who are in the same camp yeah right? we've set up <clears throat> groups and the out groups that's right yeah. and it's like oh now I feel some safety because I'm in my herd yeah. so to speak and I found my numbers and I found my my community and I find some some regulation there but it's almost like I find sometimes it's like co-dysregulation it's like oh yeah we're all <clears throat> activated in the same way and that feels validating 
Mm-hmm. And then it's almost got its own reinforcing effect. And so now we've got this nervous system pattern that might feel different from collapse or shutdown, mm-hmm. which is maybe what I would have experienced or aloneness or what have you. And this feels really yummy. It's like, it feels nice to find other people who speak my language, but if it's so polarized right there, the polarization, the splitting is really indicative of hmm, a lack of shades of gray. And so if it's that black and white, not that there aren't black and white things that are legitimate black and white, but sometimes the black and white polar- polarization really speaks to the lack of nuance and shades of gray. And that speaks to trauma patterning. Really you know? does, yeah. yeah. It's black and white thinking, as you know, yeah. from CBT would be a cognitive distortion, right? Yeah. And so exactly. how are we looking at that? Mm-hmm. And so it's kind of, it's all very nuanced. And that's why I go, wow. Like I think of the people who are listening and going, oh my God, I don't even know if I can be a horse trainer or, um, a, you know, an equine behavior person or a clicker trainer, because there's all these nuances I haven't looked at. And I think our goal is not to be discouraging, but just more that we're on the cusp of, of a transition in the industry. And it's this idea of, hey, we've come out of a period in history where horses were largely needed as war mounts and farm, you know, yeah. beasts of burden to pull carts and plows. And, you know, and so it's not that long ago that the horse in colonized society had a very specific role. And it and there's going to be all of that. And there's also, we're coming through generations of people that you don't air your dirty laundry. There is shame. You do need to appear like you've got your stuff together. You know, we don't talk about our problems. And so the horsemanship industry, the modern horsemanship industry that we see is sort of sitting on the shoulders of horse as tool, horse as vehicle, horse as serving a function for survival, right? in a generation of people where we didn't talk about healing and emotions and trauma and you know we didn't question authority figures and so we've got this ripe environment for unfortunately an industry that's now struggling and we can see it in the guru culture and the ivory towers and the splitting and the drama triads right and all these things playing out and it's like oh so i know that that feels like a lot and in time, I'm hoping that as we have these courageous conversations, that this will start to permeate more into the collective consciousness. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. And, and it'll start to raise the bar a little bit because it'll be easier because it'll already be there. It's not this massive learning curve. Yeah. It's just going to become part of the baseline. Yeah. You know, and as opposed to, oh my God, there's all this new stuff I have to learn. Yes, right now it does feel like a stacked learning curve because there is, it is maybe new. Yes. But in time, if that's part of the integration and it's just part of the language, the and it, right. And then it's yeah. not so, uh, you know, it's just, oh yeah, that is the thing I have to do. And it's completely embedded. Yes. And it, yeah. I think it'll completely change the industry. You know? And then that's, yeah, because for sure that will change decisions. It will change decisions that yeah. people make about mm-hmm. what they do with their horses and the conditions they keep their horses in and the, and the kind of training regimes that they you around their horses but you know something else that you said there about people um the the people who think oh you know I just can't even be a horse trainer before uh, uh, now anymore or 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 or, you know I can't even own horses anymore because you know I'll be colluding in some dreadful (laughs) paradigm and I think certainly from a behavioral and, and usually those are the they're the people we need to catch before they leave because they're the ones that if they don't actually, you know, jump out of the ship completely, they're going to be the ones that are in the vanguard of looking at things in, in different mm-hmm. ways. And right. certainly from a behavioral, oh, from a behaviorist point of view. And again, I go back to this is why supervision is so important because it supports yeah. those people. I see, I see behaviorists who oh you know the time and the money they spent on their training so they do the training they get the professional right. registration and then sometimes they're in practice for less than two or three years and then because I mean for sure there is there is well-meaning support in terms of they've got friendship groups groups of colleagues yeah. to support the organization but So as you know, you know, supervision to do supervision in a in an effective clinical way requires an understanding of what is involved and and training and experience in it to be able to 
hold space for those people and help them process what they've experienced in in this in these examples in their behavior consultations and because that doesn't exist for them they are just becoming burnt out yeah. in absolutely record time and then leaving the industry and such a waste there's um I love that you named that and I'm glad that you named that because it speaks again to what I look at as the intergenerational sort of trauma transmission that's that's happening because you've got people who maybe maybe people were unsafe I mean who's drawn to working with animals right so often we self-select we're back to this conversation of self-selection into an industry or a career right so maybe you're drawn to working with animals because humans were not safe exactly. and you didn't you didn't experience secure attachment you didn't feel like you could turn towards a caregiver and receive love and support and validation and co-regulation and protection and guidance that felt supportive maybe the grown-ups in your world were really shamey and yeah. judgy or non-existent and or you had to look after them and you had to be a little caretaker for the parents and you had a role reversal and so humans for whatever reason many reasons were not safe and so you draw yourself into horse training or animal behavior something or other or you know whatever and you because you animals you get on some level but if you yeah. right but then it's like oh but I don't want to seek out supervision because people are not safe I can't trust authority figures what you know like in so if we already have this starting place of my family of origin stuff influencing and the, the the authorities were not safe and then again the other people that are drawn into a lot of these professions also come from this place of having learned well I need to perform to get approval and get love and so I'm going to do that and I'm really attracted to having all the right answers and and it's all based in shame and inadequacy and needing to get approval and feel worth and so if the gurus the people I would turn to for supervision are also in their own trauma response and and feel shaming towards me I'm not going to go and get that kind of help and supervision and ask because then I also look like I don't know what I'm doing and I have my own stuff around that and what is it that people are told for generations if you fall off the horse you get right back on there's none of this healing look after your body let's renegotiate the trauma stuff it's you need to look competent mm -hmm. you need to override and do the thing so we've got this industry of people who maybe are listening to this and going yeah i'm interested in the idea of receiving consultation but there's all this activation surrounding the idea of reaching out for help because help wasn't to be had no. And who are the people you talk to? What if they're in their own trauma patterning and they haven't looked at it yet? Which is why in psychotherapy and counseling, that's sort of been taken care of by this whole conversation because a supervisor has to have done courses in supervision, has to be looking at their own stuff, has to have ideally, and again, there's exceptions, not all, not all therapists have got their stuff together, not all supervisors have their stuff together, we're human after all. But ideally, there is still this idea of oversight and and an idea that you need to do your work in order to hold safe space for others whether that's the client or the person coming to you for consultation or supervision mm -hmm. and and that doesn't exist quite yet i don't think it's not there and so if you're drawn to animals because people were unsafe it makes a lot of sense to me that there's a lack of like willingness to seek out because the whole industry is based on you need to know what you're doing, you need to have all the answers, you need to perform, you, and, it, and it's ripe for guru culture, and it's ripe for siloing, it right? It absolutely is. Yeah, yeah. Yes, the silos and the echo chambers, definitely. That's right, yeah. And the thing about succeeding, you've, you know, you've, you've got to succeed in terms of yeah. coming alongside that idea of you've got to perform, you've also got to succeed you can't be seen to yeah. fail in what whatever right. way that means or what whatever way that's perceived or experienced and so much trauma in high performance sport is about public shaming it's yeah. about you failing in a massive way and then yeah. being on the receiving end of vitriol or judgment or ridicule and so it, it's almost like the industry is like based in shame and then begets more shame and then it becomes this shame cycle and so we've got this whole inadequacy thing and and I, I can't tell you how many times I get students who are like I feel really fraudulent I don't feel like I deserve to be here I should know more of this by now 
now. And people will contact me and go, so what are the prerequisites for your course? Like what studying do I need to do before I can even enter your course of study? And I'm like, no, come as you are. Like, yeah. you know, like, you know, it's, it's like, you will learn the things you need to learn in the course. You don't need to yes. take a course to join the course. And there's so much embedded inadequacy mm-hmm. that drives, I think a lot of the horse world again, because of the early attachment stuff and love being this very conditional thing about earning love through achievement and then that's just so embedded in so much of this that it's it's just like where do you even begin to create something like hey we're going to create a standard where if you're going to be in a social license to practice what are you doing for your own supervision and consultation what are you doing for your own self-work you know, and that your own self exploration and healing and are like, how do we embed that into credentialing processes? And is that happening? How do we do that? Because it means overcoming all of this embedded shame and relational trauma that led us to into these professions in the first place. Indeed. How do we do that? And if, you know, from a TA perspective, we've got this this concept of life script. So you made a decision about your life early on based on the needs that weren't being met and then like you just you know that follows you throughout your life I love that term you used of embedded inadequacy I think that is so relevant and I think that is the that's one of the next big questions is how do we um you know how do we have these conversations that we're having here totally wider groups Yeah. Um, how do we even, you know, uh, and uh, in terms of human behavior change, I'm thinking about yeah. the trans theoretical model, which yeah. Yeah, and the, f- the first stage is even knowing that a thing exists. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, so the, the, so this is why I like these conversations. So again, thank you for your time, Debbie, today because like and and we might do more of these if you're if you're happy to chat again, but like I think about sometimes it's how are we planting the seeds? indeed and even just having these brave conversations and putting these ideas out there and inviting curiosity about them and and some people who are listening might go oh you're speaking my language oh thank you for normalizing this i might i might have needed to get the permission to feel like i could go and do the thing and and other people might be like oh this feels really daunting and they're not ready for it yet because they've got to work through whatever comes up in relation to the idea and that's the level where they're at okay that's mm-hmm. cool and that's where we're working from but it's it starts with that okay we've got pre-contemplation it's on the map we're at least yeah. on the map you know yeah. if we think of that model a stages of change model and yeah. okay and then we need to work through whatever needs to be worked through to get to the next layer and it's a process we're yeah. all human becoming we're humans we're not human beings we're humans becoming so it's a uh, an interesting thing where that's yeah, exactly yeah 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 um debbie your video just oh there we go your video came back lovely um, oh yeah i just got a message saying so. stable so are we back now I think you just you just re- you just return your audio did that robotic kind of thing, but I think it's probably a time for us yeah. to wrap up too. So it's probably a natural okay. ending point. Yeah, thank you so much for this conversation. I'm really really glad we had a chance to do it finally. Yes, thank you. Yeah, because we thought we've been just kind of planning it for a long time, haven't we? And then finally managed to get some time together that where we were both free to have it. So I've loved it. It's been really it's been kind of interesting for me made me think about some things a bit or I you know I will go away and think about some things more deeply or yeah, um, yeah just and you know that phrase you used just then about getting it on the map just getting something on the map is, yeah. is the first step and I think it's important to, to um, reflect on that yeah so thanks Lovely. Sarah for inviting me I really enjoyed it Thank you. I, I did as well. And we'll, we'll touch base again. So thank you so much for your time, Debbie. I'll just hit the stop here. Okay. So, yeah.